chapter 30 the topic is money growth and inflation we begin the study of inflation by developing the quantity theory of money now this theory is often called classical because it was developed by some of the earliest economic thinkers most economists today rely on this theory to explain the long-run determinants of the price level and the inflation rate. Let's look at some questions we are going to answer here. How does the money supply affect the inflation and nominal interest rate? Does the money supply affect real variables like real GDP or the real interest rate? How is inflation like a tax? What are the costs of inflation and how serious are they? Now, the chapter is introduced by introducing the quantity theory of money. This chapter introduces the quantity theory of money to explain one of the 10 principles of economics from chapter one. The prices rise when government prints too much money. Most economists believe the quantity theory of money is a good explanation for the long run behavior of the economy. Let's look at the value of money. In this formulation, P is the price level, for example, CPI, or GDP deflator. So P is the price of a basket of goods measured in money. One over P is the value of one dollar measured in goods. For example, basket contains one candy bar. If price is equal to two dollars, the value of one dollar is half a candy bar. If the price of uh, of candy is three dollars the value of one dollar is one third candy bar inflation drives up prices and drives down the value of money the quantity theory of money was developed by 18th century philosopher named david hume and the classical economists it was advocated more recently by Nobel Prize laureate Milton Friedman. It asserts that the quantity of money determines the value of money. We study this theory using two approaches. One, a supply-demand diagram, and two, an equation. Money supply. Money supply in the real world is determined by the Federal Reserve, the banking system, and consumers. Money supply for our purposes in this model, we assume the Fed precisely controls money supply and sets it at some fixed amount. Money demand. Uh, money demand refers to how much wealth people want to hold in liquid form. It depends on price. An increase in price reduces the value of money, so more money is required to buy goods and services. The quantity of money demanded is negatively related to the value of money and positively related to price, other things equal. Here's a diagram on the right hand side is the price level. Uh, I'll point out that uh, the way this is scaled, price is high, H, and when it moves this way, it is going low. For example, it goes from $4 to $2 to $1. And on the left side, value of money, 1 over P, and it moves from low to high, from a quarter to a half to three quarters to one. And then the horizontal axis is uh, 
quantity of money. As the value of money rises, the price level falls. So if you look at this side, this is the value of money. And if it moves from a quarter to a half, price goes from four to two. They move in opposite directions. As the value of money goes from half to three quarters, the price level goes from two to one. And it goes from three quarters to one. This goes from 1.3 to one. The value of money is inversely related to the price level. So if the Federal Reserve sets money supply at some fixed value, say $1,000, and uh, a fall in the value of money or increase in price increases the quantity of money demanded. The value of money goes down, people want more money to conduct transaction. And so when you put money supply and money demand together, you establish some kind of equilibrium. So price adjusts to equate quantity of money demanded with money supplied. Okay. Suppose the Fed increases the money supply, shifting the money supply from MS1 to MS2, The value of money falls as we move from A to B. The value of money falls from a half to a quarter. But the price level increases from two to four. We move from A to B. Money supply is increasing from 1,000 to 2,000. A brief look at the adjustment process. From the graph, increasing money supply causes price to rise. How does this work? The short version is, at the initial price, an increase in money supply causes an excess supply of money. People get rid of their excess money by spending it on goods and services or by loaning it to others who spend it. The result, increased demand for goods. But supply of goods does not increase, so prices must rise. Real versus nominal variables. Nominal variables are measured in monetary units. Examples are nominal GDP, nominal interest rate, rate of return measured in dollars, nominal wages, dollars per hour, Real variables are measured in physical units. Examples of real GDP, real interest rate measured in output, real wage measured in output. Prices are normally measured in terms of money. So price of a compact disc, disc is $15 per CD, price of pepperoni pizza, $10 per pizza. A relative price, on the other hand, is the price of one good relative to the other, which means divided by another. So relative price of CDs in terms of pizza is the price of CDs divided by the price of pizza. In this case, $15 per CD divided by $10 per pizza, and which is equal to 1.5 pizzas per CD. An important relative price is the real wage. W is the nominal wage, which is price of labor, e.g. $15 an hour. P is the price level, which is the price of goods and services, e.g. $5 per unit of output. Real wage is the price of labor relative to the price of output, and is measured as W over P, or $15 an hour, divided by $5 per unit of output, which is three units of output per hour. The classical dichotomy. Classical dichotomy is the theoretical separation of nominal and real variables. Hume, David Hume, and the classical economists, monetary developments affect nominal variables, but not real variable. That was their assertion. 
If central bank doubles money supply, then all nominal variables, including prices, will double. But all real variables, including relative prices, will remain unchanged. So what is monetary neutrality? Monetary neutrality is the proposition that changes in the money supply do not affect real variables. Doubling money supply causes all nominal variables to double. What happened to relative variables? Let's look at it. Initially, relative price of CD in terms of pizza is $15 per CD divided by $10 per pizza, which is 1.5 pizzas per CD. Now, double all the prices. So the CD is $30 per CD and the pizza is $20 per pizza. What has happened to relative price? Nothing. Okay, Doubling nominal variables does not affect real variables. So, similarly, the real wage, which is W over P, remains unchanged. So quantity of labor supply does not change. Quantity of labor demanded does not change. Total employment of output does not change. The same applies to employment of capital and other resources. Since employment of all resources is unchanged, total output is also unchanged by the money supply. Most economists believe, however, that the classical dichotomy and neutrality of money describe the economy in the long run. In later chapters, we will see that monetary changes can have important short-run effects on real variables. The velocity of money. The velocity of money is the rate at which money changes hands. The notation is P times Y is nominal GDP, that is price level, times real GDP. M is money supply and V is velocity. The formula for velocity is V equals P times Y over M. So the velocity formula, V equals P times Y over M, example with one good. Pizza in 2015, uh, real GDP was 3,000 pizzas. Price level was $10 per pizza. P times Y nominal GDP equals value of pizza equals 30,000, that is 3,000 times 10. Money supply is 10,000. Therefore, the velocity of money is 30,000 divided by 10 is equal to 3. The average dollar was used three times, uh, three, it was used in three transactions. That is the velocity of money. Active learning X1. Uh, one. One good is con, the economy has enough labor, capital and land to produce a GDP equals 800 bushels of corn. Velocity is constant. In 2014, money supply equals 2,000, price equals $5 per bushel, compute nominal GDP and velocity in 2014. Answer. Nominal GDP equals P times Y, that is 5 times 800, is 40. Velocity, V is equal to P times Y over M, and that would be 4,000 divided by 2,000, and that equals to 2. We can see from this graph uh, that velocity over the years is fairly constant. Velocity does not change, but we can see nominal GDP and M2, which is money supply, move seem to move together in tandem. They vary directly. Quantity equation M times V, that's money times velocity, is equal to price times GDP. Number one, as we have seen, velocity is stable or constant. Number two, a change in money causes nominal GDP, which is P times Y, 
change by the same percentage. Number three, a change in M does not affect Y. Money is neutral, Y is determined by technology and resources. Four, so P changes by same percentage as PY and M. Number five, rapid money supply growth causes rapid inflation. Active learning two, quantity theory of money. The one good is corn. The economy has enough labor, capital, and land to produce 800 bushels of corn. Velocity is constant. In 2014, money supply equals 2,000. P equals $5 per bushel. For 2015, the Fed increases money supply by 5% to 2,100. Number A. Compute the 2015 values of nominal GDP and P. Compute the inflation rate for 2014, 2015. Number B, suppose technological progress causes GDP to increase to 824 in 2015, compute 2014-15 inflation rate. Number A. Compute 2015 values of nominal GDP and P. Compute the inflation rate for 14-15. 2014-P times Y equals M times V. So V is 2 as we have seen. 2015 nominal GDP which is P times Y is equal to M times V is equal to 2100 times 2 is equal to 4200. In 2015, P is equal to M times V over Y equals 4200 divided by 800, which is equal to 5.25. Inflation rate 2014-2015 is the percentage increase in price 5.25 minus 5 divided by 5 uh, and that would be 5 percent same as money supply b suppose technological progress causes y to increase to 8.24 in 15 compute 2014-15 inflation rate all right, 2015 P equals M times V over Y is 4,200 divided by 8,24, and that would be $5.10. Inflation rate for 14,15 is five, $5.10 minus 5 divided by 5, and that would be inflation is 2%. Lessons about the quantity theory of money. If large GDP is constant, the inflation rate is equal to money growth rate. If real GDP is growing, then inflation rate is less than money growth rate. The bottom line here is economic growth increases number of transactions some money growth is needed for these extra transactions. Excessive money growth causes inflation. Hyperinflation is defined as any inflation exceeding 50% per month. Price rise when government prints too much money. We saw that in one of the 10 principles. Excessive growth in money supply always causes hyperinflation. Example is Zimbabwe between 2007 to 2009, there was hyperinflation in that country. It led to the creation of large quantities of money and very high inflation rate that made the currency practically worthless. Inflation as a tax. Inflation tax is the revenue the government raises by creating or printing money like a tax on everyone who holds money. When the government prints money, 
the price level rises and the dollar in your wallet are less valuable. In the US, the inflation tax total today accounts for less than 3% of total revenue because inflation is low in the United States. The Fisher effect, the principle of monetary neutrality is an increase in the rate of money growth raises the rate of inflation but does not affect the real variables. Why? Because real interest rate is equal to nominal interest rate minus inflation rate. We get nominal interest rate is equal to real interest rate plus inflation rate. The Fisher effect is the one-to-one -one adjustment of nominal interest rate to inflation rate. When the Fed increases the rate of money growth, the long-run result is higher inflation rate and higher nominal interest rate. And as you can see from this graph, nominal interest rate and inflation rate move in in tandem, they move together. This, the close relation between these variables is evidence of the Fisher effect. Costs of inflation. Inflation fallacy. The inflation fallacy is that inflation robs people of the purchasing power of his hard earned dollars. When prices rise, buyers pay more, but sellers get more also. So inflation does not in itself reduce people's purchasing power. So that is a fallacy. And as you can see, over the years uh, from 1970 on, uh, you can see that CPI and nominal wage move together. So inflation does not really rob people of purchasing power. Shoe leather costs. These are resources wasted when inflation encourages people to reduce their money holdings. It can be substantial. Menu costs. These are costs of changing prices. Inflation increases menu costs that farms must bear. Misallocation of resources from relative price variability. Farms don't all raise prices at the same time, so relative prices can vary, and it distorts the allocation of resources. Confusion and inconvenience. Inflation changes the yardstick we use to measure transactions. It complicates the long-range planning and the comparison of dollar amounts over time. Tax distortions. Inflation makes nominal income grow faster than real income. Taxes are based on nominal income, and some are not adjusted for inflation. So inflation causes people to pay more taxes even when their real income does not increase. An example of tax, tax distortion here, you deposit $1,000 in uh, the bank for one year, there are two cases here. In the first case, inflation is zero, prices don't rise. Nominal interest rate the bank is paying is 10%. Is 10 In the second case, inflation is 10%. Nominal interest rate, therefore, is 20%. A. In which case does the real value of your deposit grow the most? Assume the tax rate is 25%. Number B, in which case do you pay the most tax? Number C, compute the after-tax nominal interest rate. Then subtract inflation to get the after-tax real interest rate for both cases. So here, number A, as you can see, $1,000 deposited and uh, the first case Oh, let me go back one step. In which case does the real value of your deposit grow the most? In both cases, the real interest rate is 10%. So the real value of the deposit grows by 10% before tax. Um, the second case, number B, in which case do you pay the most tax? Case number one, 
interest income is at is a hundred dollars so you pay 25 dollars in taxes in the second case interest income is two hundred dollars so you pay fifty percent in taxes tax distortion number c compute the after-tax nominal interest rate then subtract inflation to get the after-tax real interest rate for both cases case number one the nominal interest was 75.75 times 10 percent is 7.5 percent real is 7.5 percent minus zero percent inflation is 7.5 in case number two nominal is 0.75 times 20 percent which is equal to 15 percent real is 15 percent minus 10 percent is five percent compute the after-tax nominal interest rate, then subtract the inflation to get the after-tax real interest rate. Summary and lessons. Inflation raises nominal interest rate. That's the Fisher effect, but not the real interest rate. It increases savers' tax burdens it lowers the after-tax real interest rate. Arbitrary redistributions of wealth, another effect of inflation. Unexpected inflation redistributes wealth among the population, not by merit, not by need. Redistribute wealth among debtors and creditors. Inflation, via, inflation volatile and uncertain, when the average rate of inflation is high, all these costs are quite high for economies experiencing hyperinflation. For economies with low inflation, that is about less than 10% per year, these costs are probably much smaller, though their exact size is open to debate. Conclusion, prices rise when government prints too much money. We saw that uh, money is neutral in the long run, affecting only nominal variables. In later chapters, money has important effects in the short run on real variables like output and employment. Summary. To explain inflation in the long run, economists use the quantity theory of money. The price level depends on the quantity of money and the inflation rate depends on money growth. The classical dichotomy is the division of variables into real and nominal. The neutrality of money is the idea that changes in the money supply affect nominal variables, but not real ones. Most economists believe these variables describe the economy in the long run. The inflation tax is the loss in real value of people's money holdings when the government causes inflation by printing money. The Fisher effect is the one-to-one -one relation between changes in the inflation rate and changes in the nominal interest rate. The cost of inflation include menu costs, shoe leather costs, confusion and inconvenience, distortions in relative prices, and the allocation of resources, tax distortions, and arbitrary distributions of wealth. And that is the